Good morning. Seven days to go in the transfer window and we could be set for an incredible week as the Saudi Pro League once again tries to make its mark in the transfer market. Ronaldo, Neymar, Benzema have all made the move to the league. Will Mo Salah be the next big name to join them? Well, it's a huge story dominating today, but Liverpool's stance is clear. He is not for sale. This hour, we'll hear from Jurgen Klopp live. Lots to discuss and debate this morning in the company of Harriet Pryor, Flex and Kwaku Afari. Good to see you guys. How are you? Good morning. Good, thanks. Well, deadline day is only a week away and the big stories just keep on coming. Mo Salah is not for sale, say Liverpool, but that won't stop Al Isihad, who say they'll do everything they can to try and sign Mo Salah. They're even prepared to offer a transfer fee of more than £100 million. Harriet, happy Friday. Happy Friday. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. So Salah <laughs> to Saudi. What's the initial reaction from Liverpool fans? Probably not a very happy Friday, I'll, I'll be honest about it. I don't know if shock's the right word because there was obviously these links earlier on in the window linking Salah with a move to Saudi Arabia. His agent at the time earlier this month quickly shut that down, tweeting, Mohammed remains committed to LFC. If we considered leaving LFC, we wouldn't have renewed the contract last summer. That eased things a little bit, but now... They have decided al had to come back in to press. And we know that Saudi Arabian clubs have really been pushing this summer to, to make a mark. And when they've gone after a player, they do tend to be persistent and come back in. So it's not entirely surprising, but I think Liverpool fans will mostly just be hoping that this one isn't going any more advanced than the initial talks. There hasn't been talk of an initial bid or anything like that yet. He's an incredibly important player. We can look how long there is left in the window, but I don't even think that matters because whether you had seven days or seven months or seven years, there's not many players that could come in and have the same in impact as Mo Salah and we'll come on to his numbers and, and stats and everything he's won a bit later on in the show. But ultimately, he is irreplaceable to Liverpool. People can talk about his age and the fact that he's over 30 now. Does he still have that impact? Well, he, he absolutely does. He keeps himself at the top of his game. He never lets those levels drop. He is a standard setter. You speak to any player in that Liverpool squad, they will say that he is the one that is first to training, that is winning the bleep test, that is working hard. He is the standard setter. He raises the levels and he turns up even when other players in the team don't. Individually, incredible. Team player, also incredible. Has so many elements of his game that I just do not think Liverpool will be able to replace, particularly with just seven days left in the transfer window. So, yes, Liverpool fans will be hoping that this is a, a happy weekend and any news of this is quickly brushed aside. That was heartfelt. Because, uh, <laughs> that was like a monologue. Mo, don't leave. That well, was, yeah. yeah. Did you feel that? Was that powerful? I, I hope it. so. Great start. Yeah. <laughs> Great start to the programme. Kweku, money is obviously a huge factor. It's an extraordinary amount of money. He'd also be joining up with his former teammate Fabinho. Yeah. What do you think the other reasons are? What else would be tempting him to make this move? Well, let's not get twisted. There's 1.5 million reasons why Mo Salah would go to Saudi Arabia and that's the reported <laughs> uh, weekly salary, which is a huge increase in what he's on at the moment. In terms of meritocracy reasons, there's not much to say for going to Saudi Arabia at this point, apart from collecting the paycheck. What you'd say about Mo Salah is that he's achieved everything there is to achieve at Liverpool, both individually and club honours. He's won every club on, club trophy there is to win. He's won the PFA Player of the Year multiple times, obviously multiple golden boots. He's, um, he's a player that, when you talk about Premier League football, he will go down as a complete legend. And so, like you say, Liverpool have done good business with Saudi Arabian teams previously, especially in this transfer window. We look at Fabinho, we look at Firmino, we look at Jordan Henderson. But Particularly, this is different because their stance on this one is that they will not sell. They do not want to negotiate. I think there was an acceptance around those players that maybe they were willing to, to come to the end of their life cycle at Liverpool. Maybe they didn't have as much left to give. I do not think there will be any acceptance from the club's perspective that it is Mo Salah's time to move on from Liverpool, regardless of the fee, that they're not willing to sell this player to anywhere. I completely, I completely agree with that as well. You can't go and find another Mo Salah. He's one of the best players this Premier League's ever seen. You can't, they don't grow in trees, players like that. And obviously, in recent years, they've lost Mane, they've obviously lost Firmino. That was a legendary front three, one of the greatest we've ever seen in the Premier League. And, and seven days to go in transfer window, you've not left Liverpool enough time to go and find a replacement for him. So, despite the fact that there are reasons for him to go, I just can't see Liverpool letting him go. What do you think, Flex? Seven days to go, Mo Salah knocks on Jurgen Klopp's door and says, look, I'm 31 years old now. I really want to go to Saudi Arabia. What do you think? You've subbed me off in the first two games. <laughs> <laughs> oh. 
Um, what do you think Jurgen says? I, I, I think... I think that's the only way, because I agree with, with what you both said. I, I can't see Mo Salah leaving, I'll say that first and foremost. But if there was to be any change, what we have heard is that Mo Salah would have to force this issue. He would have to say, I want to go do basically what you just said. I do think that puts Liverpool in a, in a precarious position, because if the player comes and says, I've had to think about this, actually, this is best for me, I need this... What, what what would Jurgen Klopp do? I still think he should say no, <laughs> personally. You've just signed a new deal. You know, no player's bigger than the football club we'll in terms of... the way of... to Mykonos. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> exactly, exactly. No player's, no player's bigger than, than the football club and we have to put ourselves first here. You've just signed, uh, was it five? He's, he's got two years left on his contract. He's got two years left, but he signed an extension. He signed an extension last right. night. Right, signed an extension. Um, and like you said, his agent's been, been saying that, you know, if he wanted to leave, we would have let Liverpool know. But Liverpool, I think, might have to be quite selfish in this because if you look at the transition that's happening at Liverpool, lost so many key players, and then you get into the breath of Mohamed Salah, which is a completely different ball game of trying to lose him as well, it would just be a catastrophe for Liverpool to lose him at this late stage. However, on the flip side, though, with what he has given to Liverpool Football Club, if he, I, I, I don't see Mo Salah agitating for a move and being a disruptive character. It doesn't seem like that sort of player. But if he does plead with Jurgen Klopp and say, Jurgen, please let me do this. I've done, I've done everything and I know I didn't think this was going to be for me, but actually, I can't turn this down. For my family, for me, actually, this is right. Please, can you make this happen? That would pull on the heartstrings and I, and I don't know what would happen then. But you're acting like he's not still the best played player at Liverpool. I know it's yeah. a different scale and I understand those things, that it's life-changing and that's the argument we've given for a lot of players moving over to Saudi Arabia, but he is Liverpool's highest paid player. And you mentioned there he's, what he's given. He has still got so much to give. He will be targeting another Premier League. He will be targeting another Champions League. What if he decides no, actually? But why would he? He's not got that mentality, I don't think, no. where he's thinking, you know what, I I'm out now. He would not continually try and keep himself at the level that he have yeah. if he's just willing to, to walk away from it. He wants those individual records. He's spoken openly about how much those things mean to him. He wants to go and, and smash everything there is at Liverpool and win trophies with the club can as well. I also ask them, what, what individual records can he go and achieve? He's currently Liverpool's fifth all-time top goal scorer. He's behind Billy Liddell or Liddell, who's 41 goals ahead of him. He can go and score more goals for Liverpool, but whether he catches him remains to be seen. There's not much more that he can go and achieve. What records can he go there and break? I mean, you, you saw his reaction when he was taken off on the first day of the season, yeah. and that was purely for the record of scoring on consecutive opening days. Even these little things mean a lot to him, but for him now, I think at Liverpool, it is the team trophies. It's not so much about the individual records. It is about winning another Champions League. I think that would be the big one for him, the Premier League as well. Those two, he feels like he's still got something to give in terms of team sweats for Liverpool. So he is a, he's a real team player and I think he's targeting those trophies From a now. Liverpool fan perspective, what I'd be interested to know, maybe, <laughs> maybe we can ask this, I don't know, and I'll ask it to you, but I don't want it to feel like Hashtag we're just asking you all the questions. <laughs> exactly. But is there not a point where sometimes there is a price for every player? Like, if, Saudi, if, if Liverpool went, OK, well, you know what, if Saudi, if, if Saudi Arabia come in um, or our... our What's the team? Al-Isiad. Al Al-Isiad coming for him and say, 150 million, 200 million, we don't care, we'll pay it. At what point do Liverpool, Liverpool go, say we cannot turn it. that down? Is there a point of that? Is there? I just don't know if for a player like Mo Salah there is, to be honest. We saw that there was a point with Henderson. We saw that there was a point with Fabinho. Obviously, there's an argument that an amount of money will be able to take a player away from a club. But Liverpool, at the moment, their stance is no, not willing to negotiate. He is our player. We need him for the season ahead. We do not need to be giving ourselves more work to do. And that, that's the end. You sound like you're not willing to negotiate. You're <laughs> not having Harriet, it. you have some stats to back up what you're saying. I why do. Liverpool are saying that he is not for sale. So uh, Harriet's going to go over to the video wall and, and show us why Liverpool... Don't want to lose him. This is like part of a PowerPoint <laughs> presentation where I'm now going to present to, to tell you us, all tell us how important why he is I do not Liverpool. think. Well, no, and I think we're going to start with the goals that he scored. Hopefully that comes up soon. But it was, a, it was an interesting one because when he scored 44 goals in his, first Premier, in his first Premier League season across all competitions, everyone was saying he's not going to reach those levels again. Maybe he's a one season wonder. He won't be able to stay consistent. And then he's managed to do that year after year. 
And I think his lowest um, goal return is 23 goals across all competitions. He's never dropped lower than that. The consistency with all of the goals he scored and some of those vital as well, scoring, of course, in the Champions League final. He's often painted, actually, as a bit of a selfish player. That's something that's thrown at him. But you can see here with the 80 assists to the other side of his game, the link-up play, the creativity, the way he provides for other players in that team. Kweku earlier mentioned that emphatic front three alongside Sadio Mane and Firmino. They were aware of a lot of those assists came from, but looking ahead to the season now, Diogo Jota, Darwin Nunes, Cody Gakpo, the relationships that he's already formed with those players is incredible, and those assist stats will continue to go up. And if we look here now at Liverpool's rankings over the season just gone, you can see how integral he still is, even when he wasn't at the top of his game last season. And I think he himself would have said he didn't perform quite the standards he sets for himself and expects for himself. He still ranked first for, for games, for goals, first for assists, second for chances created, first for shots and dribbles completed. And the big one there actually is the games, 38 38 games in that, he is so consistently available. He rarely picks up an injury because he works so hard to keep himself fit and, and readily available. And that's another huge thing, consistency you cannot replace and availability you cannot replace. And then finally here, the honours that he's won at Liverpool. This Jurgen Klopp era has been a huge period of success and Mo Salah really has been crucial and key to absolutely all of that. The Premier League, obviously, winning that and bringing that after such a long time that Liverpool fans have waited for. FA Cup, EFL Cup as well. The Champions League, him scoring the penalty in that game to put Liverpool ahead. And then all of the other the trophies that he's won as well, alongside three Premier League golden boots. He has been an integral part of this era of success under Jurgen Klopp and he's a player that Jurgen Klopp simply will not want to lose just a few days before the transfer window closes. I would say that's pretty irreplaceable, but if you think there's a price, Flex, Kweku, tell so, me now. So name, your, name your price for replacing <laughs> all of that. So basically, with the end of what you just said there, complete the set. <laughs> complete the set, He wants more. Complete, new, complete new the set, but They're we go again. They're not in the Champions League this year. So, you know, yeah, yeah, yeah he about. hasn't completed the set. He needs a Europa League, League on there. Oh, yeah. there, we go. there we go. Right. Oh, my <laughs> goodness. Yeah. I thought only the elite concerned himself with the elite trophies, and now yeah. he wants no, that. No, I, I do understand the argument that they are in the Europa League this year, but I think every Liverpool player in that squad and fans alike would be saying that that should just be for one season. They're aiming to get top four again this year. They need to be competing for that next season. He's targeting everything. He goes into every season saying, I want to win. We want to be competing at the very top. Mm. I don't feel his mentality will say, I've completed the set. My work is done. You say that, though, but we, the current Ballon d'Or holder is currently playing in Saudi Arabia and, and Karim Benzema. Cristiano Ronaldo... How many played... Champions Leagues did he win? Yeah, but <laughs> Mo, Mo Salah's not going to win five Champions no, Leagues. No, I understand that. He... But he won more than one. He I more, think, he won know... more than one, but... Cristiano Ronaldo, who's singularly driven to win and play at the highest level, is playing in Saudi Arabia right now. He paved the way for it. And Mo Salah is the most famous Muslim footballer in the world. There are other reasons apart from football achievements to go and play in Saudi Arabia. Cristiano a lot older than Mo Salah. Yeah, for sure. Not a lot for older, sure. Five, six years old. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, the yeah these are okay. different points in his career. Mo Salah is still in his physical prime. He's still one of the best players in the world, where Ronaldo wasn't. Mm. But there are reasons. And also, if you look at the vision of Saudi Arabia as well. Michael and Milano has talked about it quite a lot in terms of what they want to do, who they want to target. It's not just the case of our Etihad, the team that's focusing on buying them, it's the league in general that want most of to come and play there. And they will make all efforts to try and bring them over, both financial and both selling the, the idea of the Saudi Pro League. I do understand the draw. I'm not, I'm not discounting that. I do understand the reasons why he would go financial and all the, the ones you just said as well. I don't think it's a league to be laughed at anymore. So many incredible players have gone there and he'll, he'll notice that. It's different to if we were talking about it at the start of the transfer window. We know the talent that's gone over there. But Liverpool at the moment know that they're in control, that he's their player, he signed a new contract last summer, they will set their price, they, are, will, they will be the ones to decide whether they are willing to negotiate or not. And looking at all the stats I just talked about there, I just don't feel that they, they feel they can let him go this year without having adequate time to bring in a replacement. And I mentioned earlier, seven days is certainly not enough to do that. Seven days here, but one thing to note, the window in Saudi Arabia it doesn't actually close until the 7th of September, so a week later than transfer deadline day here. And now, while all the Liverpool fans were feeling pretty stressed <laughs> last night, it's clear that Mo Salah really wasn't. He looks... <laughs>
very chill. He's playing tennis. He was, no, he was playing, he was playing chess was playing on his chess. Instagram. Oh, sorry, it's chess. Oh, here we go. It's a chess movie because he doesn't know where he's going to go. Oh, oh, see, yeah. do I go? I, do I, go, I actually think it was the opposite. I was think, I think it was him saying, "You're all stressing out on Twitter, and I'm just playing a little bit of chess and going to post a selfie." Read into it. What you will. I'm sure Mo Salah's pretty good at chess as well. And you won't want to miss this at 9.45 this morning. Jurgen Klopp is speaking to the media and we will bring that to you live on Good Morning Transfers. I wonder what he'll be asked about. <laughs> <laughs> but looking forward to that. And a line from Chelsea to bring you as well. Midfielder Andre Santos is on his way to Nottingham Forest. It will be a loan move and a formal announcement is expected soon. Time now for a break, though. Loads stills come as West Ham close in on Mohamed Kudus. And Manchester United stand firm on Mary Earps' future. We'll react to that next.
Welcome back to Good Morning Transfers. It's time to turn our attention to the WSL now, where Manchester United have no intention of selling Mary Earps, their keeper, who won the Golden Glove at the World Cup, was the subject of a world record bid for a goalkeeper in the women's game. We can speak to United View TV's Mina Ibrahim now. Mina, good morning. Thanks for coming on. This seems to have come out of the blue. Did it catch you by surprise? Not at all, because Mary Earps, if any of you guys do know, is one of the greatest goalkeepers in women's football right now. She won the Golden Glove for Manchester United last season and also won it with England at the Women's World Cup, approaching 12 months in her contract. I'm not surprised that other teams are sniffing around with what would have been a world record fee for a goalkeeper. She's deserved of it, but she's also deserved of a new contract at Manchester United. So hopefully they can definitely tie that down soon. You say she deserves a new contract at United. Just how important is it that they keep hold of her? Yeah, it's, it's very important. You know, last this summer that just passed, we saw Manchester United lose both Alicia Russo and Honor Batier on free transfers to Barcelona and rivals Arsenal. The last thing that they would want now is to lose one of the most vocal people in the team and also a leader in that backline in Mary Earp. So they have to sit down with her and get that new contract out of the way, definitely before January, before she gets the opportunity to speak to other the clubs and you know being linked to a, 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 a team that's in the Champions League is no surprise because that's something she wants to win she wants to win trophies she wants to win silverware if she can't do it at Manchester United she might look at doing it elsewhere but with the way that Manchester United are currently moving hopefully is something that she can do with Manchester United. Mina we don't know who made the bid yet if it is another WSL team how much of a blow could that be potentially losing her to a rival team? I mean, it could be a big blow and I think it might actually be a bigger blow than losing Alicia Russo on a free. Uh, Manchester United are looking at replacing Alicia Russo with two other strikers. They've already brought in uh, Jace from Barcelona, but it would be very, very difficult to actually replace Mary Earps. Of course, going into a market for a goalkeeper would not be the priority for Manchester United. But if that is the priority, then they'd have to change, I guess, their transfer strategy that they're looking at. What more do you think... They need, Mina, in the final weeks of the window, if they want to build on last season's second place finish. They need reinforcements. You look at Arsenal, you look at Chelsea, all of them bringing in reinforcements practically before the season even ended and before the World Cup actually started, whereas Manchester United only brought in their main signing so far about a week ago. So they definitely need to get the reinforcements in. They've had some players leaving, of course. Manchester United as a whole is kind of hindered right now with the takeover talks, which is actually impacting the women's team quite quite difficult um so they definitely need to bring in some players they need a striker they need a midfielder they need some backup on the bench so hopefully it's something that they can get done in the transfer market before the wsl season starts in october mina great to get your thoughts thanks for coming on good morning transfers we're continuing with manchester united defender luke shaw has sustained an injury which will rule him out of forthcoming games flex Bad start to your morning, wasn't it? <laughs> We've both had great Fridays so far. Happy oh, Friday, yeah. Flex. Yeah, honestly, for different, different reasons. It's, it's bad news. It really is. Um, Luke Shaw's been fantastic for Manchester United of late and actually for having quite a few injuries in his career. This has been quite a good spell for Luke Shaw without any significant injuries. Um, and that's why I think we've seen him play quite well on a personal level. Yes, it's been a ropey start to the season, but Luke Shaw usually is very dependable. Um, we've had an injury to uh, Terrell Malassia, who was brought in to kind of push Luke Shaw last year and did quite well in that respect for, for a breakthrough season. But Luke Shaw, definitely the more senior player and, and the number one starter. Um, and, it's, and that's the really difficult one for Manchester United to look at now um, because in-house there needs to be a solution to that. Do you think it's essential that they bring someone in or...? Or is it in-house the only option? There are some reports surfacing today suggesting that Manchester United may look at a short-term option. But the way I see it on a, on a personal, in my opinion, is to look in-house. Alvaro Fernandez was potentially about to go to Granada on loan. A 20-year-old was really good at pressing North End last year. Um, I, would, I would stop that loan and say he needs to stay. Um, I know that Brandon Williams has left the football club and gone to Ipswich now, but that probably wasn't in Eric Ten Hag's plans as it was. And there is Diogo Dallo. Uh, Diogo Dallo has played 
left back quite a few times, can easily play in that position. It's not his natural position, it's not where he wants to be, but he's versatile enough to play there. He did so uh, in quite a few games last season and can, can easily fill in there. And, and it's my view that Ten Hag will probably go with him in our next game against Forest and, and do that. But I think Alvaro Fernandez needs to stay at Manchester. I, I would like to look for a replacement in-house. And there's a one there already made um, for, for him. So, and, and money's an issue as well. I know the free, the free market. We had a look at the free market and the left-backs that, that are there. The quality maybe isn't there. Um, so I, I wouldn't want to spend money on something that is, is going to be something that's relatively short-term. Manchester United are also deciding between two keepers if Dean Henderson leaves the club. United are ready to do deals with one of Fenerbahce's Al Tibinde or Benfica's Odysseus Vlachodimus. Crystal Palace remain in talks with United over a deal for Dean Henderson. But Harriet, United running out of time. What's the most likely outcome here, do you think? Yeah, the goalkeeping situ situation at Manchester United has gone up and down during this transfer window. First of all, with the departure, obviously, of De Gea, Anana comes in, a really good first-choice keeper. So now they're looking at the second-choice option. Tom Heaton would have been that, but he is now out with an injury. Dean Henderson has been linked with a move away at the entirety of the transfer window. We know that he had a very successful loan spell with Nottingham Forest. He feels ready to step up and take that number one shirt at another team. He feels he's proven he can do that. He's clearly not going to get that opportunity at Manchester United. So he's looking at a move away now. I know Crystal Palace is a club that has been linked. But in order to do that, they want to bring someone in. And those two things basically have got to happen simultaneously. One will not happen without the other. The two players there that you've just mentioned, sensational pronunciation of... <laughs> you do it again for me? Vlahod oh, Vlahodimos. Yeah, yeah. You know, Odysseus Vlahodimos. Vlahodimos, amazing. <laughs> and by India as well from Fenerbahce. But they would need to... Those two deals would need to happen at the same time. So one of those two keepers coming in, Dean Henderson leaving, it will, it will need to happen simultaneously. I thought it would be kind of simple for the, those things to happen, but with only nothing a few days simple. left, nothing That's is simple. Manchester United it feels like it's yeah. dragging on a little bit, and it's just probably a problem they could do without. I just think they need to get this one done. So they've got their first choice keeper. That's obviously an Anana. They get their second choice option in. Case closed, but the days are, are dragging on, and this one's still not sorted just yet. As for a midfielder potentially coming in, they remain interested in Fiorentina's Sofian Amrabat. Quaker, can Manchester United realistically sign him without selling a player? They need to shift some bodies in midfield, and Harry pointed out that goalkeepers have been a saga for Manchester United this window. From the first two games, we can see that centre midfield is an issue for Manchester United. Van der Beek is still in the books. I think he's a player that surplus the requirements. I don't think he's got a long-term future in Manchester United. Obviously, Fred's already gone, and they have been talked about McTominay possibly leaving Old Trafford. But he adds that physicality, McTominay, and that's what may not have been severely lacking in midfield. And people have been criticising Casemiro in terms of performances, but there's not bodies in there to help him do his job. So Manchester United probably do need to shift for financial reasons to bring in a centre midfielder, but. I think they need kind of the bodies they've already got there and the profile of players that they are they are targeting. It, it kind of baffles me because you need a ball play in the centre midfielder and that's what Amrabat can do, but he's not necessarily, that's not his primary job. So it's a, it's a bit of a mess of Manchester United in terms of centre midfielders, but they probably do need to shift before they can bring somebody in. Should be simple, folks. It should be simple. <laughs> we knew exactly what we needed to do before the window and, and now we're getting towards the end of it and it's looking like a little bit of panic. You've done it with incomings though, to be fair. It's yeah. just the outgoings now. The, out, the outgoings were supposed to be sort of a, a nice, easy transaction. <laughs> These players probably leave, get other players in. May not never sell but well, though. They that's just not what well. happens. No. It's just not what happens at Manchester United at the minute. And, but Sofram Amrabat would be a fantastic acquisition considering where we are right now. Right, time now for another break. A reminder, Jurgen Klopp will be live in the next 15 minutes. News from West Ham as they hope to sign Mohamed Kudus.
Welcome back to Good Morning Transfers. We start with West Ham and technical director Tim Steiden is in Bulgaria finalising a move for Ajax midfielder Mohamed Kudus. Kudus scored a hat-trick in Ajax's Europa League playoff victory at Ludogorets last night. If a deal can be fully agreed, Steiden and Kudus will fly to London so the player can have a medical and sign off a five-year contract. Still work to do on the deal, but a willingness from all parties to get it done. Quaker, you've watched quite a bit of him. Just how big is his signing for West Ham? Huge. If you consider the clubs that he was linked with at the beginning of this window, Arsenal, Chelsea. So if West Ham can pull this off, it'll be massive. He was Ajax's best player last season. It was a difficult season for Ajax, um, but he was definitely their star man. He had great performances in the Champions League against Liverpool, um, against Rangers, scored some memorable goals. Maybe I tailed off towards back end of the season, but overall was was very, very instrumental in everything good that Ajax did. Um, also played very well for Ghana. He's a player that can play in a multitude of positions. He can play on the left wing and right wing, false nine, a bit deeper as an eight as well. I'm gutted he's not coming to Chelsea, if I'm being completely honest. Another one? <laughs> <laughs> I'm gutted, are you? I'm gutted, I'm absolutely gutted. But not enough money has been spent. You know, I'm, out, I'm out here pleading poverty for my club. <laughs> Unbelievable. Uh, but he, he, can, he, can bring a lot, he can bring a lot to West Ham. And it would be a good window for West Ham overall if they can pull this one off because he is such an exciting player and can challenge a lot of players in West Ham's first 11. So, like I said, if they can pull off and get this deal over the line, then it's a great acquisition for the club. I think it's been a really good window for West Ham in general. There was a bit of criticism early on about the fact it was taking them a little while to spend that Declan Rice money. If you look at their incomings now, Ward Prowse already done really good things. Alvarez, Mavropanos, they've recently got in, strengthened in a few key areas, reinvested the money that they got from Declan Rice across a few players who look really talented. And I think the key thing for this player as well is his versatility, which you touched mm -hmm. on there. The fact that he's played as everything from a deep-lying number six to an out-and-out -out striker. He brings so much, and I think David Moyes will be looking at those things and thinking, let's bring him to West Ham and not Chelsea, because Chelsea <laughs> have, done a, have done a few things already this window. You, you'll be okay, well, you'll be okay. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah, he's injured though, isn't he? So. Out for a while. <laughs> <laughs> <It's gutted. laughs> well, West Ham are looking at alternative targets to Yusuf Siri. They've been in talks with Sevilla, but they've been unable to agree a deal for the Morocco forwards. How crucial, Flex, is it that they find an alternative option? Absolutely. Very, very, uh, very crucial because of all the good work that you've said they've done, fantastic players that they've brought in, at the top end of the pitch, a goal scorer, a focal point, a, a regular number nine that they can depend on. Um, we spoke yesterday that it kind of always falls back to Mikel Antonio, who I think deserves massive respect for what he's done um, in his career and specifically at West Ham. Always managing to reinvent himself, always managing to, to chip in with goals and, and tough performances and give defenders nightmares, whether Skamaka comes in, whether it's Hilaire, whether it's Arnautovic, Danny Ings. You know, there's four just there, and now we're still in a situation where we're saying it's still Antonio. It looked like it was going to be en Naziri, but I think to, to really um, build upon those uh, um, guys that they brought in that you said, uh, Harriet, they really need to get a number nine sorted because that's almost like the, the missing piece. You add in, adding Kudis into that. I know he can play a little bit as a false nine, etc. but David Moyes will want a, a real talisman up there to help support Antonio, um, and, and they really need to get that sorted for sure. Time for another quick break, but Jurgen Klopp is coming up live in just a few minutes' time. We'll bring you his news conference shortly. Stay with us.
Welcome back to Good Morning Transfers. Romelu Lukaku remains a Chelsea player for now. The Athletic and David Ornstein are reporting this morning that Chelsea would be prepared to let him leave on loan if a sale cannot be agreed. And this is what the Chelsea head coach, Mauricio Pochettino, had to say about his future yesterday. Club and, uh, and the player was the wish of both to try to find a solution. On the end, in the future, can change, can change the things, always, in football, in life can change, you know. I, I saw a club that say, I never, I, I'm not going to be in this business when you should pay 100 million. And then they offer 100 million and say, oh, I made a mistake. And, you know, that is the same situation. For sure, in football, is really, the dynamic is really, you know, fast and change, and, and we need to move on. At the moment, today, is nothing changed. If something changes, we will adapt to the new situation. Meanwhile, Manchester City have a new player. They confirmed the signing of Jeremy Doku last night from Wren. It's a deal worth £55.5 million. Here's what he had to say about his move to the Champions. I always knew that the Premier League was made and built for me. Um, and uh, I had, um, till now, I played in Belgium, I played in France, and I think that the, those were the right steps to prepare me for, for the Premier League. So, uh, yeah. My goals are to fit well in the team and uh, win more trophies, because um, I don't have any trophies yet. But I'm, I'm sure that with this team we can win a lot of trophies, so that's my goal. A really exciting young player, just 21 years old, but we heard him say there he feels ready for the Premier League. Kweku, where does he fit into this City team? He slots in on the right-hand side. He fills the, the space vacated by Riyad Mahrez, who, of course, left the club this summer. Um, but he's a throwback footballer. He's a right-footed right-winger that attacks his full-back. He's going to give left-backs nightmares and fits because he, he is very aggressive and very direct. And like you said there, the Premier League's made for him. He did also speak about how he talked to Kevin De Bruyne, who's his Belgian teammate. Um, so settling in should be pretty seamless for him. But I think he's going, to be, he's going to get City fans off their seats this season because he's going to be very exciting, very direct. Wasn't the most prolific at Ren last season in terms of numbers, but in terms of what Pep Guardiola can make him as a player, I'm very excited to see what Doku will do in the Premier League. Agent KDB. Agent KDB. <laughs> well, next then, their focus could return to Mateus Nunez. Now, they had a bid of £47 million projected yesterday. Harry, how likely do you think it is that Manchester City will go back in? How much do they need him? It's clearly an area of concern. They were linked with Pakatar earlier and, and that fell through and now they've been linked with Nunes as well. It's a player they feel like they need and it's clear to see why. Good Nuran left in the summer and then the injury of De Bruyne, it really does leave a creativity void in that midfield area. If you look at some of the stats, Good Nuran, 11 goals, 7 assists last season, but the crucial one, De Bruyne out, 31 assists last season. You're not going to bring anyone in that's going to fill that void, but I do think they feel they need an external solution, even though we know how good Pep Guardiola is at finding solutions internally. Right, let's return to Liverpool then, to the huge story of the day regarding Mo Salah. The Liverpool boss, Jurgen Klopp, has just sat down for his news conference. I'm not used to that. Yeah, yeah, OK. Uh, Jurgen, can we start with of Mo course. Salah? <laughs> um, is it still the case that there's not been an offer from yeah. Saudi Arabia for Mo? And if an offer were to come in around a £100 million mark, which is the figure being talked about, Obviously, Mo is 31 with two years on his contract. What kind of decision would you and the club be facing weighing up the business side against the football side? So, but I really, but it's always a bit difficult to, 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 to talk about media stories. So, because there's nothing to talk about from our point of view. We don't have an over um, Mo Salah is Liverpool player. Um, obviously, for all of the things we do, essential was, will be. Um, so, yeah, there's nothing there. If there would be something, the answer would be no. Um, but that's it, pretty much. So he's not for sale, but <laughs> are there any concerns? What concerns do you have that, given the speculation, given the things no, that they talked about, it could no, be I, 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 my, my life philosophy, or one part of my life, is, uh, I think about the problem when I have it. That's um, enough time then, because there is absolutely nothing in the moment. So um, when I... Um, 
if there's something coming up that I don't think um, or I don't know, yeah, then I can think about that. But I said already, it's, um, if there would be something, it would be a no. And in Mo, you still see your players fully committed to Liverpool Football Club? 100%. Coincidentally, you play a team backed by Saudi investment this weekend as well. Newcastle, they've obviously been able to shake things up in terms of the race for the top four. What opportunity do you see this weekend to lay down a marker once again in your own ambitions for this season? Well, what a turnaround in the question. <laughs> so, um, it's an away game at Newcastle. Newcastle is an incredibly strong team, qualified for the Champions League. Fully deserved. Super development under Eddie Howe, I have to say. Um, smart business. The two, don't want to miss anybody, but probably the two stand out in this window. Tonali and Barnes, really good, re really good um, business. Um, super intense style. Um, massive atmosphere there. So, this is a, a tough one. Play the a really good first game where Aston Villa was really good as well, to be honest. In the end, the result didn't reflect probably the the, the full game, but in the end, how they used their counter-attacks and stuff like this was absolutely exceptional. So the speed they have is really... To Newcastle, since they see at least that they don't concede a lot, but score. So, yeah, that's a, that's a proper game. Um, and we tried since Sunday night to make sure that we are ready for it, and that's it. And just checking on team news, Trent, Thiago, Curtis, how are they? Trent, yes. So from Monday on, Curtis from Monday on, um, and Ibu is a, a doubt. Mm -hmm. So. Um, yeah, playing 40 minutes with 10 men didn't help. Let me say it like that. Um, but that's um, um, that's a situation. So that's that. Yeah, no, presses should be available. Good news about Alexis, anyway. Yeah, very good news. <laughs> you forgot that. You work longer together. Well, Sorry. Massive, massive. Um, I was not sure after the game, eh? so I, I, when I saw the pictures back, and I was pretty sure that it's not a red card, but that doesn't mean then immediately that it will, uh, that, that our appeal will be successful. Um, I think uh, we could make the point really clear, um, and the pictures were pretty clear as well. We don't have that um, a lot of times that everybody agrees on this is not a red card and should not be a red card. It's a bit of an early in the season, a bit of a message as well. So yes, harsh tackles um, and stuff like this should always be punished. I'm absolutely, um, I support that 100%, but it was not a harsh tackle. It was just a, a touch um, in, a, in a situation. So, um, and I said it was for us on a day already tough enough to play then in, um, in the circumstances around about 40 minutes with 10 men. We were obviously not prepared for that, but we scored the third goal, which was very helpful, and then we had to fight through it. And um, so, no, but it was a massive relief when I heard um, it's overturned. I'm not sure if you're aware, but you, you've beaten Eddie Howe as a manager more times than any other manager in the Premier League. It's 11 times. Um, is there anything in the, the way that, that he sets his teams up or the way he plays that you think particularly brings out the best in your teams? I remember, unfortunately, in this case, not a, a, a defeat at Bournemouth. Remember Christmas, I think, was it? Not sure. Um, so, um, no, that's nothing. Eddie is a super coach, super manager. Um, my f my first home game was against Bournemouth in the, in the cup, in the League Cup, one 0 Nathaniel Klein. I'm right. I'm pretty sure. <laughs> so a rare occasion, Kleine scored, and uh, and and um, we we had a massively changed team um, on the day. But um, no, I I can't explain that. Um, obviously, well, for sure, a few times on the lucky side of it. But um, yeah, that's it. Right. Yeah, again, 
it's not easy to sign one day for a team and come in and play the next day. <laughs> and I don't think Wataru and though was maybe expecting to play the amount of time he played last week. But but how impressed were you with his contribution? I think when he came on, he won he won a tackle within about ten seconds and really contributed well. Now he's had a week in training and you get the feeling he can add a lot more balance to the team, to, to midfield. Yeah, it's still early days, but yes, you're right. Um, it will come on top of that um, after um, one and a half days, pretty much half a session, um, playing in a team who has to defend with 10 men, pretty much is really, is really difficult. I think he did really exceptionally well for that. Um, now we have him here three sessions now this week, um, looks good, um, yeah, is a, is a good player, just like that, but I really think we, we, it's, it's like, if it would be that easy to bring somebody in in, in, in the center of the park and it would work out perfectly after, uh, after three days, why we train them with all the others so long, and we could just do it always like that, bring them together and play the weekend, um, and so, yeah, um, I'm, I was and no, it was not. Expected. We had him on the bench to bring him on, but obviously later um, and in a slightly different situation. But so he did well, and now we can use that. The first, the the first marker is set. If you want, and now let's go from there. Away from the most sour speculation, what do you think FIFA and the footballing authorities need to do? I said that already. No, but it's an ever-changing situation, isn't it? In terms of the way that the Saudi Pro League, money, money's always talked and, and talked very loudly in football, but this is a completely, they're playing with a, a different deck of cards to anybody else, even perceived footballing world powers. I, I understand, 100%, that's not comfortable, it's not cool for us, that's how it is, but um, so if we go and want a player from, I don't know, uh, Wigan Athletic, so and we go there and, and, and they, they, they tell us the price and we pay it, probably, probably. But it depends a little bit, not only us, big clubs in the world of football, stuff like this. The Bundesliga like that, if Bayern comes, if Dortmund comes, then Bielefeld, Mainz are, they don't, cannot really react on that. So that's the, that's the way it goes. And now, yes, there's a next level, definitely, and it's not, it's not great. And, but I think this is kind of part of the business, I'm not sure if, if you can change that or if somebody uh, will change that, but what makes it from a specific moment on pretty much not possible to deal with anymore is in the moment our transfer window closes and the other transfer window stays open. So, and if they don't stop then, then it's like, um, okay, and how, how can we react? We have, we have a squad together for the, for the season, what we try to have until next week. Um, and of course, then from that moment on, we play until the 1st of January. Um, and this is our team, our squad. So that's how you. That's what everybody's used to. And now you have that problem. In the past, if I remembered right, with Russia, uh, uh, long ago, thankfully, um, but that, that they had a different transfer window and still could still come and stuff like this. But that was not with that kind of completely crazy money. Um, and yeah, it's not. It's it's new. It's challenging for everybody. Um, and. We have to learn to deal with it, that's what I would say. But the authorities should make clear um, that if you want to be part of the system, then be, do your business in the same time like all the others, at least. Um, if we cannot change the rest, then at least let's, let's change that, because I'm pretty sure that people could do that like this. Not sure they want to, um, but they could. All right, so Klopp speaking there, saying Mo Salah is not for sale. No offers have been made. Next, it's Total Football. A host of Premier League managers are on the way, including Eddie Howe, who's up against Jurgen Klopp on Super Sunday. Liverpool travelling to St James's Park. We'll hear more from Jurgen Klopp in the next hour.